Good afternoon. Happy International Women's Day. My name is Dr. Jennifer Hawkins, and I'm pleased to serve as your moderator for this important conversation on creating change from the ground up, how Black women are leading the way to health equity. It's brought to you by the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, and we're so pleased to feature speakers who bring a wealth of knowledge to our audience of teens, parents, educators, healthcare professionals, and other key stakeholders about how commercial tobacco use Black communities. We appreciate all of your time and commitment of our guests here today. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Camille Sanchez, from the Com Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. Camille. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins. Good afternoon, and welcome, everybody, to today's Campaign for the Culture event, Creating Change from the Ground Up, How Black Women Are Leading the Way to Health Equity. Our Campaign for the Culture initiative is focused on uniting, empowering, educating, and engaging people of color and other targeted communities around critical healthcare and human rights issues connected to tobacco use, with the goal of inspiring young community members to avoid or quit tobacco use. Thank you so much, Camille, for that important uh, uh, introduction. We're going to start uh, right now introducing our guests to the stage, our virtual stage, if you will. Um, can I please have our guests join us? Chanel Poe, Jalisa Bolden, Kiana Sears, if you're here, Miss Chanel Poe, and Jalisa, I mentioned already, and I think we're just waiting for Kiana, but she may join us for the, the second panel. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, Chanel, I'm gonna start with you and maybe you can give an introduction before I kick it over to uh, our question here. The tobacco industry puts millions, you know, millions of dollars into targeting communities of color with their deadly products. How have you used community organizing to push back against the industry? Wow, um, you're absolutely right. I mean, who knew that the Black community, I mean, even as a little girl, when I used to go buy packs of Newport and menthol-filled cigarettes for my granddaddy when I was like, you know, uh, living in a Black low-income community in Detroit, who knew that we would be a part of Big Tobacco's plan? I most certainly didn't. Um, I think it's really important right now that we need to enlighten our community. A lot of people are unaware of the chemical-laced, products that they uh, put within side of these particular cigarettes. I think it's important to galvanize the community. There needs to be community calls to action. And I'm very fortunate uh, to be working with a uh, campaign for tobacco free kids right uh, in Tempe, Arizona, uh, right in my locality, uh, where we are really helping educate the public, but also calling on our elected leaders for a health uh, equity imperative. We know what the disparities look like. Once again, a lot of our community is not familiar. They don't know how they can get involved. They don't know how they can make a difference. Uh, for instance, what we did in Phoenix in December, we hosted a uh, movie uh, documentary, uh, Black Lungs, Black Lives, uh, movie documentary preview and community discussion and we had a great turnout of different organizations. You know, it's always great to reach individuals who are also um, unaffiliated community members, but it's also great to have those strong groups and organizations who have a vast variety of members who are in and up across the state. Um, once we have those conversations, we are doing call to actions. We are showing up at our municipal committee meetings and city council meetings. And most recently in February uh, in Tempe, Arizona, our coalition for Flavors Hooks Kids Tempe held a Black History Month uh, press conference, really speaking to uh, the city of Tempe, who is appearing to ignore the health equity um, disparities and look towards more so being more business friendly and really caving in to those tobacco store owners. So it's really about educating, enlightening the community, galvanizing the community, and then empowering the community because a lot of people may feel as if their voice may be one of many and it may not be heard. We do 
personally as cultivate those relationships and really help bring out the best and also those stories to truly make it real and authentic. Thank you, Chanel. I think that's so important and really um, take heed to your words on the call to action, how we actually get elected officials and leaders to address the disparity um, in Arizona uh, where you live. Jalisa, you know, you're working for the Moss Point District in Mississippi, a, a very important area uh, and district and stakeholders. What are your concerns about youth nicotine addiction and how it's further exasperating uh, tobacco related health disparities in your community? Yeah, so, um, you know, the it, it's growing with vaping and um, our kids are just um, getting things from from all different um, places. Um, for me, one of the concerns is the mental health um, disparities that we're seeing. Um, lung cancer, the, the, the kids are um, having cancer a lot younger. Um, we have a lot of environmental issues here as well. So just those things coupled with um, tobacco and nicotine being uh, plastered and shared and um, highlighted in spaces that they occupy is a, a big concern. Um, educating our parents, um, and more so in the school district on the in Jackson County. Um, I'm in Jackson County, Mississippi. We have a Jackson County um, Tobacco Free Coalition where it's parents, educators, and people of the community kind of working together to educate parents about uh, vaping, tobacco, all of those things that impact our children and that they have access to so early. So for me, a lot of the concerns is exposure, um, having accessibility, them having access to it, and the health disparities that we're seeing that comes along with it. Um, we spend a lot of time um, in, in leadership development programs or service programs just infusing information about health um, because a lot of times that's not a conversation that we as a people consistently have. And so if we can infuse um conversations about smoking because that is something in our community that we all all of us have a, a, a uncle or an aunt that had menthols or newports or or something of that nature if we can start um having those conversations with them a lot earlier we can decrease the the usage of it in in young people and so um having those conversations um with our youth and our students is important and we put programs in place so that they can ask questions and put health um, care providers in place so they can explain the um, long-term effects that this might have on a young person. Um, I, uh, to, to, to Chanel's point, like educating and um, engaging the people is very important because a lot of it is done because of lack of knowledge. So one of my biggest concerns is making sure that our children are educated about what tobacco, what nicotine does, the, the process of addiction, um, the process that what it does to your brain and how it um, reduces things <laughs> um, and slows your brain down, can cause a lot of chemical imbalances and cause you to have have all uh, various types of cancer is very important. And a lot of people think that it's to scare, it's a scare tactic tactic, but it's honestly the truth. If we start talking about it much earlier and, and making connections in our own families, we can identify where some of these cancer streams come from. Um, I know my parents were smokers majority of my um, my childhood, and one day my mom just decided to stop because we were rolling up towels and sticking on our doors because we didn't want um, our clothes smelling like smoke, but my mom also died at 48 of cancer, So and my grandmother died of cancer as well. And so it's one of those things that I can kind of uh, tie to in my family when I'm talking to my younger cousins and my nieces and nephews that, you know, it, it, it does it does do something to your health. Like it does do something to your lungs. Like we can tie back to that. So just making those connections for kids, because when they learn things and when they believe something, they tend to stick to it. So I, I, I'm I big about um, sharing knowledge, empowering and educating them because we can can we can 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 turn um turn this thing around if kids are educated about like what it really does yeah it's cool yeah it might look cool but it will have some severe health disparities um and have some severe health issues with you um as you progress or continue to use those products 
Jaleesa, thank you so much for sharing your lived experiences, you know, particularly with your mother and grandmother, because you're right, the accessibility is key and education is key of those long-term effects is crucial for our young people. Kiana, welcome, Monsieur. It's so good to have you here. We're thankful it for is you to join us. It is so awesome to be here. Thank you so much. And happy International Women's Day. You know, Absolutely. my first question for you, Kiana, as someone who works with faith leaders, um, they certainly has a really impactful way to inform the community. They're trusted advisors in the community. They're obviously um, kind of the first responders, if you will, uh, for the Black community in terms of folks needing help and education uh, about some critical issues. Can you speak um, to the role that you think faith leaders really can play in health equity? Faith leaders are critical, and it's in more than one way. We and we are way past the days in which we say, let's pray about it, right? We actually have to address the microaggressions and the realness of how that impacts and actually leads to part of the addiction process. Just trying to find a coping mechanism to ease all of the stress and anxiety our children experience. As people are talking about mental health, we have to really think about what children are saying in schools. And as I'm in schools, I'm hearing children say, actually, I need a hit of Nick. What in the world? What is actually going on? So it's not like the children are just so dumbed down where they don't understand that psychologically and physiologically, this is giving some relief. They get that part. So faith leaders need to uh, speak to the trauma that our children are continuing to experience. So we're compounding that historical trauma that happens. And as they're speaking to the parents and they're speaking to the kids, it's about the healing that is so vital in our community that needs to take place. We're still at a pat place where addressing the need of self-love, community pulling together as we're pulling together for this cause and banding together for this cause, but the need to actually heal the trauma that is still happening, not just historical trauma, but right now today, the, the microaggressions and just the blatant racism that's happening. We're still calling for the legislation regarding the Crown Act, which actually being denied, how we actually show up, how our hair grows out of our head, those social issues need to be taken on by the church in a real way when it comes to the hurt, the pain, the trauma that is still happening. So as we say, don't smoke, and this is why, and this is how this is actually killing your body, we actually have to further address the ways our souls are being crushed and what's happening with the soul of our young people. When, when this generation, as we have activists stand up and young activists, because it's always young people who move the needle when it comes to these movements going forward, we need to empower, love, and address that from mental health perspectives and all who are responsible from school leaders, elected leaders, because we still know the exploitation of Black people is actually so crushing all the way down to our kindergartners. So hence, we address not just, okay, kids, stop doing this because of all the things it's doing to kill your body, but also souls as we address mental health and suicide and all of that. What are these root causes? And it actually starts systemically with all the things that's going on. So that's part of the conversation. When we talk to our faith leaders, it's about dress, addressing, yes, this is killing our bodies, shortening our lives, but it has to be complemented with more than prayer. It has to be complemented with the wraparound services that's needed and all the social entities that address the actual exploitation of our kids and the soul crushing things they experience in, at every hand in our school systems and all um, systems they interact with. That's where we are right now in America. 
those are such important points and particularly the coping mechanisms and generational trauma, as you said, uh, old and new, the new trauma and the important work of soul saving that our faith leaders can be a huge part of. Thank you so much, Kiana, uh, for that response. Angelisa, um, you know, you can you speak to the work that you're doing to really uh, reverse tobacco related health disparities in your community? Um, and then we'll go to uh, Chanel. Yeah, so um, uniquely enough, Moss Point, and I don't know, you know, context wise, if you guys are aware, we are in Mississippi and we're on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, and Moss Point is predominantly African American community. Well, out of the 141 cities in the state of Mississippi, Moss Point is a smoke free city where we have ordinance where people cannot smoke uh, e cigarettes or vape. And that was important. And we did it in 2012. It was important because smoking, we have, I mean, every other corner, you have a gas station, you have one of these little smoke shops. Um, and kids were able to see, like seeing people smoking everywhere. So in all public places, restaurants and um, public facilities, there is no smoking. Um, and, and again, in that in that process of getting that ordinance passed, it was important that people understood the health related issues that come along with secondhand smoke. Like, I mean, you probably do this at home, but you know, you can't go into this public restaurant smoking because it's impacting other people in their family and our community is dying at a higher rate of all of these illnesses or, or these particular um, health components. So it was important that we did that work. So we also have a, a tobacco free coalition, um, what I, I stated earlier, and it is a body of people who are working toward um, making sure that, you know, our the smoke shops that are around are not selling to young people. Um, um, they, we have a Catch My Breath program, which is implemented in the schools, which it educates students in our health classes about vapes. We have vape sensors in our schools. So, I mean, if kids are vaping, like we can address those issues um, early on because once they are addicted or once they have picked up this habit and it's a strong habit, it's really hard to break. And they're learning these things from um, be it siblings, be it peer pressure or what have you. So. We have we have done a, almost like a a, a, a citywide uh, grasp at educating people about smoking, educating them about the the use of tobacco and how it is impacting our community specifically. Now, all of the all of the cities along Jackson County, it's only two cities that are like that, which is Moss Point and Pascagoula, which are two cities that are adjacent to each other. But to say that you know in in other areas where it's tourist populated you know that there, there's a lot of smoking going on and kids are seeing that so we are are um trying to be on the forefront of making sure that our community understands that you know people come to our community for this reason so we have to protect our community by way of ordinances by way of educating our students and by way of not allowing um our our community to be a smoke fest in 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 in, in the kids terms um we do a lot of uh billboards and public education we have a mlk coastwide committee that does a lot of things around social justice and um health disparities around black just black issues anything that has to do with black people and we spend a lot of time educating um those those people who participate in the financial workshops, the health workshops, the the uh, voting um, engagement workshops, just letting them know like th th the tobacco industry is targeting our kids. They're targeting our communities. Like we must protect it by any means, and we have to educate our people to understand that this is not th this is not going to be the way that we go out as a people. And so, just making sure that um, we protect our spaces. And I'm so proud of my community because we are a 100% minority community that has a smoke ordinance that does not allow people to smoke cigarettes, um, e-cigarettes, or vapes in our community. And I'm I'm very proud of that. Well, we're very proud of you as well because those ordinances and laws and legal protections are a huge accomplishment. And hopefully it'll be way more than two areas that you can expand to. I know that, you know, the bigger the reach, the more impact we'll have in that area. Chanel, can you can speak to a little bit about how commercialized tobacco really gets in the way of achieving 
health equity, particularly for black communities? So like, like flavors hooks kids. Um, the flavors not only hooked our community, uh, but when they started targeting the black community, again, I didn't realize that we were a part of the plan for them specifically to target black, low socioeconomic communities, uh, particularly. Um, we noticed that menthol, 85% of black smokers, they smoke menthol. Is this a coincidence? I don't think so. How did this happen? They were, they were handing cigarettes out. Um, they were making them extremely appealing. I can remember Billy D. Williams, the, the camel and other black entertainers growing up, um, being sponsors. And when you think, about that intersection, I think it's very important that we are rooted in understanding that a lot of these black entertainers were not receiving sponsorship back in the day. So then it comes to a point when you have to create a livelihood for yourself to have additional sources of income uh, to come in. We have seen them making, looking, um, utilizing uh, cigarette caricatures. Uh, we've seen them do it first with the Native American community. We've seen them do it in the African American community specifically. Um, Using black, using blackface, you know, I've seen images uh, that goes as far back as uh, using blackface and essentially using words like, um, "Well, your life is terrible anyway. You're you're lazy anyway. You have nothing else to worry about." And what I think nowadays, specifically, there are uh, studies um, that have shown that African Americans are the largest consumers of little cigars and cigarellos. And when we saw when the pandemic hit, a lot of health experts, you know, really turn to the black community. Like we know that y'all smoking those blunts. And if you get contract COVID, it's going to rip your lungs up. It's going to tear you something new. And we saw that that had already exacerbated that healthcare condition. Um, we also see it being used as a political, a political pawn. Um, some politicians may see it as or elected officials may see it as, you know, being pro-business, or if they put such of an ordinance, they're going to be anti-business. That's not the case. We say health equity. Uh, for every municipality, to my understanding, has a health equity component. Thank you so much, Chanel. I think that's really important. And, and I'm happy you touched on the advertising and the attack um, on Black low socioeconomic communities. And I think that is an important. Um, I didn't want the background to cut in on what I want to say, but I have uh -huh. to say this so y'all can hear me. The flavor end up targeting us. When we utilize cannabis and people who engage in cannabis, it's always busting it down in the flavor blunt. I know that that was my first experience years ago recently recently to about four to five years ago then was only i realized um, by connecting with someone who educated me and said oh my gosh no do you know all these things that's like inside of there and jalissa when you talk about the health the, uh, the unintended consequences of secondhand smoke someone who i look at as a grandfather has surgery who has stopped smoking for 25 years because of secondhand smoke that he had in his bar is killing us and we don't even know it when we go back Back to education we could talk to moms and parents and families who are in shelters who have no idea they blowing smoke in their kids face and we have to hold our composure and meet people exactly where they're at opposed to being judgmental so when i see those parents or see individuals blowing smoke in their kid face i want to make sure that i um you know that i educate them and let them know did you know that that you could produce uh secondhand smoke that could produce cancer and asthma so i think that you know we have to have more concerted educational opportunities jalissa me coming from the background of education in terms of bringing in the healthcare professionals that was my next move um when i was on the school board that was my next move to bring in the pediatricians uh to help make it real so the children didn't feel like we were just lecturing to them but 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 dr hawkins flavors is hooking us it's over 200 of them and and menthol has been a tradition like you said in so many black families and unfortunately it's something that gets passed down where it becomes a part of the culture um there is a number of things that we can do by getting involved locally and following a campaign for tobacco free kids but as far as like those those targeting methods they got so much money 
that we're just going to have to take these organized strategic actions. Yes. Thank you, Chanel, for those powerful words and um, all ring true for us in so many ways, and particularly the flag for secondhand smoke, which we need to actually alert our community on more creative ways of the damages. Kian, I'm going to give you the last word for our last few minutes here. You know, the NAACP has been on the front lines really of advancing racial justice for as long as we all on this call can probably remember. Can you explain how tobacco and nicotine addiction in the black community is a social justice issue? It's a social justice issue on every hand because the NAACP is erasing um, barriers of uh, discrimination and on every pillar. So one, we've spoke a lot about the economic um, imperative that money as in greed is actually in of this. This not only takes money and robs money from children's future, as you see children um, not doing those things that could actually better their future. And you look at what's going on historically with their parents, not investing in things that would further our um, future economically. So the economic imperative, when you actually look at once you're addicted, what it actually costs monetarily to continue this habit, to go in and see that this product is from five to seven dollars and the average smoker is spending fourteen dollars a day on this habit time 365 is a huge investment and a waste so first economically further having the black family that doesn't have three hundred dollars savings in the bank spending on a monthly basis sometimes three times that amount on this product that's the first thing keeping us from being able to address other things and needs that we have in our family and our community. Secondly, the imperative of education. When you have children that have asthma and have these health effects, they're losing, there's a bunch of learning loss that actually gets paired. So when we saw COVID and you talked about learning loss, it's also sickness and disease. Children who are attending school less because of asthma and asthma related um, things that has to do with tobacco and definitely secondhand smoke. Even those children who may never take up a cigarette ever is now struggling where, cause we have low weight babies we have. So from birth is putting our children at a disadvantage. Then you go on to look at social justice being always eradicating racism from day one the Black community being targeted is a racist act. Actually taking a vulnerable community and knowing that this vulnerability, preying on the ability for us not to be seen, preying on our psyche, preying on the economic and the health disparity. So when a predatory agent works against an entire community, that's racism at a blatant stage. So eradicating and erasing racism is what the NAACP um, works against. So hence this being a social justice issue. So well said, um, Kiana. I I couldn't have said it better. (laughs) The snaps are all around. (laughs) Our sisters here are supporting you on that in so many different ways, Uh, social justice issues stem down from health disparities like this one, like as you said, not only address the Black community, but also the socioeconomic part of it. So it is persons who are at a different socioeconomic advantage than others who are being targeted, whether through advertising, which was brought up, or corner stores in our communities are now, um, including vaping and hookah, which has become very hot you know, popular for young people in our community. So I just want to thank you, Chanel, um, and particularly Chanel who made the time in in between a flight to get on a plane. That's how she is so committed to this issue. Jalisa and Kiana, for all your incredible work and your input into this important conversation on International Women's Day. Um, Our next conversation is with Dr. Monica Wilson, who is the regional director of the California chapter of Parents Against Vaping 
e-cigarettes. I would like to welcome Dr. Wilson to the stage. Hi, Monica. Welcome. Hi. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you so much for being here. We're delighted to have you here to join us again on this important conversation. So Dr. Wilson, can you share how you got involved in this work and how you were driven to be a tobacco control advocate? Well, you know, I work locally with many of the primary care um, settings in the county that I reside in in California. And through that work, actually um, have facilitated parent workshops through middle and high schools for over the past five years, um, facilitating those actual workshops, focusing at the time um, around behavioral health, looking at our youth and making sure that they had act, uh, adequate services. The parents would directly come up to me after or even during talking about the issues that they were seeing with their children actually being exposed to vaping products unbeknownst to them and the impact that that was having on them physically and psychologically. I knew at that time I had to find a space somehow um, to support these parents that were going through such a uh, traumatic experience in knowing that their sixth grader, their 11 year old, their 12 year old, their 19 year old, all the way to 16 were now vaping and no one around them actually knew how this happened and was fortunate enough to come across a Parents Against Vaping and E-Cigarettes, which is a volunteer based organization and national organization with parents who have the same passion uh, that I did in regards to supporting these parents. And there I went full Monty <laughs> across the state and nationally to inform individuals that we have to understand the implications that when young people begin to use nicotine, they, as we know, 80% of them as adults will continue smoking or vaping and the lifelong health effects that that will have, unfortunately, will reduce the quality of life experience. And so that just put me out there, Dr. Hawkins, full Monty, going strong, fighting big tobacco. Like I said, supporting these parents at the parent wellness committees, also the local PTAs. I've been able to partner with them in order to educate them around these issues that are impacting our young people. And it has, like I said, been an absolute joy just to continue to work in the tobacco space, but also be able to correlate this, like I said, with the behavioral health implication that we are seeing, unfortunately, that are happening with our youth. I love the term going into full Monty. <laughs> yes. Because so, that is true, right? You see everyone as your child, your nephew, your niece, and right. um definitely be able to relate and support those parents. Um, it's, it's so crucial. And so I know you have this very interesting background in behavioral health and healthcare. Yeah. And I'd love to hear a little bit about that. And can you speak a little bit, maybe dive a little bit deeper into the mental health burdens kids today are facing, yeah, um, absolutely. particularly with e-cigarettes that is really increasingly more popular today? You know, absolutely. You know, one of the things that we've been able to do um, in the work with Parents Against Vaping and e-cigarettes is follow the path that the flavors actually generate and literally get, you know, kids hooked on these nicotine products. And so out of that work, as you said, I'm a staunch advocate, a mental health advocate. Um, I work in many capacities um, at the state and local level um, in the behavioral health realm and literally have been able to, like I said, see young people, unfortunately, getting addicted to nicotine and their personalities just completely shift. Um, and the impact of that, you know, when you are inhaling this form of nicotine on their, not only the physical health, but the anxiety that now is producing because their brains are still developing, as we know. And in that process, unfortunately, it alters them completely. You have a whole different person. They um, begin to be more anxious. We see higher increases in depression and anxiety. Um, and unfortunately, you know, this can lead and what we've been seeing is correlations between the isolation of a young person who's vaping and trying to keep this a secret with suicide rates. We have seen since the pandemic, unfortunately, a rise 
on the e-cigarette and vaping products amongst our middle and high school teens. And unfortunately, more, higher rates of them going to the emergency room, dealing, like I said, with you can overdose from these um, devices. And actually, like I you know, mentioned, the implication that it has just on the whole wellness of that child, it completely changes them school performance, as we know, in the spaces are the first things that uh, parents begin to see, that grades go down, isolation, not wanting to interact with their peers, all sorts of things. But more importantly, what's happening to them is a biological effect of the overabundance of nicotine that's now unfortunately affecting their uh, mental and behavioral health. Such important flags you just raised. I mean, I don't think we talk enough about the overdose that yeah. can happen. And I think we warn our children of alcohol abuse, drug abuse, and overdose. But what really struck to me is the overdose yes. and health effects that this can actually have of our kids and isolation due to obviously COVID and other pandemics and epidemics that they may be having that will may force uh, children and teens to isolate. So that's such an important flag. And you yourself are a parent, Dr. Yes, Wilson, and as a parent in the fight for tobacco-free generation, yes. what changes do you really hope to see? Us? You know, across the board, I have been fighting. Um, we just, you know, had legislation and these policies around removing these favor uh, bans need to be a comprehensive one that is in every community. We talked about the social justice implications of that, and now we see it directly targeting our kids. And we have to get the policymakers to understand that we must remove these flavor products and, you know, re reinforce the laws that are already in place, the ordinance that we heard in our last panel. But we must get parents more involved in communicating with their local policymakers to understand that until that activism happens at the local level, unfortunately, these trends will see. We want these products off of all social media. We talked about the advertising because social media, as we know, is a big space for advertising. And unfortunately, we're young people can get access to these products. So there needs to be policies around that. And obviously just hold big tobacco accountable for preying on our children in the interest of greed. The reality is this is a, you know, as we talked about the revenue and the cost that's associated with this, imagine a young person literally trying to figure out how they're going to get access to these products are able to do it. If we don't enforce the ordinances that are already in place. And like I said, remove these flavored products across all communities and make this, you know, how we went into motion on COVID. I'm wanting us to go into motion on preventing nicotine addiction for our future generation, which is our teen and our children who are, have been targeted literally for the past five years extensively. And like we mentioned in um, wanting to reiterate the mental and behavioral health effects and also the physical effects, we are seeing at alarming rates and we're in an epidemic in regards to these nicotine products affecting our kids. So removing them, flavor bans have to be enforced, monitoring what Big Tobacco is doing. Unfortunately, when you have a ban, there's always something that seems to try to come behind it to reverse it. So being on top and wanting others to, like I said, get involved in the advocacy work that's already out there. Organizations like our own, you can volunteer, get support, get resources for parents who are already experienced or teen who may have unfortunately are dealt with or dealt in um, vaping or e-cigarettes and know that you're not alone. That is, if anything I can say around this too, is that as a coalition, as you see, we have a community of individuals who are working tirelessly to get these products off the market, but more importantly, to support the families who have kids, you know, kids who've been affected by that. And we can do that by holding our policymakers accountable to the laws that we have and also pushing for more ordinances to really remove these products completely off the market and also selling to underage kids or selling illegal products, period. Retailers need to be held accountable. And those enforcements need to come in place and be monitored at all costs. 
Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Those are really uh, important messages, particularly uh, for our parents and the idea of local legislation. We always think about national, but local right. legislation is so important to really attack some of, like you said, the ads and the monetary income that a lot of companies are making on behalf of our kids. Um, so, Dr. Wilson, I want to say thank you again. We are so blessed and grateful that you have joined us here today. You've been working on behavioral health care for a long time. And as a parent and an advocate, yes. you are saving the future generations from tobacco. And for that, we are forever grateful. So thank you for Dr. joining us, Dr. Wilson. Dr. Hawkins, thank you so much. Well, our final panel, we would like to bring Delish uh, Dijelsel Kelly, um, who is the lead project coordinator. I know. So, <laughs> your name again? I, I'm butchered. Jalissa, it's fine. Jalissa Kelly. Jalissa Kelly, thank yes. you for joining us. I had it right earlier. Uh, our final <laughs> panel, um, who is the lead project coordinator of the No Menthol Movement in Atlanta, Georgia. And Tambra Ray Stevenson, who is the founder of Women Advancing Nutrition, Dietetics, and Agriculture, uh, the WANDA organization. Tambra, welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. Um, so, Delicia, we'll start with you. It's been said when, when Black women lead, we all win. Can you speak to how the leadership of Black women has a huge impact, particularly on the advancement of social justice movements writ large, and then perhaps this social justice movement in particular? Oh, wow. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins. That's a great question. Um, particularly today being Women's History Day or Women International Day, we've seen how um, women, great women in the past have laid great foundation for me to even be in a position to answer the question you just posed. So um, when you have Black women in position and also being supported in the role, we're able to just be ingrained with the work based off of just being able to be resilient. I know we always have that question of always, you know, Black women always have to be the strong one, but we just have certain characteristics that allows us to be able to sustain the work that we're doing, to be, or to also work with passion. For me, I always tell people I'm a servant leader. I'm here to lead, lead my community, be able to advocate for those that feel like they don't have a voice, but also show them ways that they can advocate, which is why I, you being a champion in my community has also been um, very heartwarming for me because I see the growth. I can definitely see how um, as an organization, we're mobilizing efforts. I just also wanna share just a quick testimonial. Um, as you all remember in the pandemic, the heart of the pandemic, it was so much social riot going on here in Atlanta. Particularly if you all remember the Rashad Brooks, you know, when that occurred, like the Wendy's was being, uh, blazed down. It was just so much ride and disposition. And as you all know, I'm based in Atlanta. That is in my backyard. Um, my coworker, Nika Gillum, you know, she came on a call, one of our team meetings, and she was like, we need to show the community how to protest peacefully. That's how the No Menthol Movement ATL was actually birthed. Um, the coalition, Heart Coalition, Health Education and Research and Tobacco, I've been working there for over six years. And with the coalition has passed four policies around tobacco control, within the schools and the parks. So 100% tobacco-free school in Atlanta and also in Fulton County. So we wanted to show like, hey, we can continue to do this work, but we're gonna do it peacefully. We know the history and the context behind menthol, how it also impacts our community. Wherever you see those high saturation, you know that's the pose of having systematic racism things in place. So with having a great leadership and my boss, Mr. Vincent Vandegrave, I have to shout him out. He's very supportive in the role. So oftentimes black women may be in spaces where they may not feel supported. But within our team, we have the leadership that say, how can we continue to add value? What do we need to do? But not only that, we go into our community where we can ask our community members, what do you want to see? How can we position it in a way where our community can understand us being maybe high level and public health professional? You can't speak that jargon when you're talking to when you're talking with your community members. So another uh, pillar that we always like to uh, highlight is that we're not talking to them, we're talking with, and we're talking with understanding, we're talking to listen, we're talking to be able to create in a way that sustains the effort. As a nonprofit organization, you all know, we are able to do our work through funding, but we are serving and passionate leader. 
work. So how do we continue to do this work without the funding? So we use a, a you know framework with a end in mind, but also to be able to reach the needs of our community. I will also share one more example because I think this this is always rallying me up every time. So last November, you know, Great American Smoke Out. So we had an event and we partnered with um, Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids on this as well too during that week. So we were at the library where we did an outreach. Once again, we wanted to meet the needs of our community. We went where our community members were. And for those we knew that would have benefited from the information or resources that we wanted to provide. For this event, we were doing go cold, go cold turkey for a turkey, meaning if you give up smoking, we'll give you a turkey with the week of Thanksgiving. So one of the community members, I mean, they were lined up. It was like, it was supposed to be at two o'clock. They was there like 1.15. I was like, y'all, they are here. So uh, <laughs> the community member, she was like, um, she asked me, she was like, so how much are the gift cards? Because we weren't given actual turkeys because of COVID. We wanted to make sure everything was safe. And we told her the amount. She was like, well, you know, that might not be enough for a turkey or ham. As you all know, inflation of food has gone up tremendously. So she was right. So I took her response. I said, hold up, I'm going to talk to the team and um, see if we can double up the gift card so you all can have something to take away. Um, because we wanted to make sure we're not just coming in and say, take this. This is We're just giving you what we want. We want to hear, okay, what are some of the issues behind it? So long story short, we were able to give them the turkey, the double of the gift cards. Um, we had like the campaign for tobacco-free bus out there with more resources. We had vendors that were there with insurance. So information that met the needs for the community as it relates to tobacco, ways to give up um, smoking, but also also, they were able to feed their family, at least have a turkey on their table that week. So once again, um, we're always a listening ear. It comes in its management down. So everyone that works within our team, that is some of the leadership style that we like to take into our community. Because if we want to get people to stop smoking, we need to be able to listen to what are the reasons behind for them to even start from the beginning. So um, this is a social justice issue in many ways. If it's women's health, you could talk about reproductive health. So you got to know your audience. So that's that's some of the takeaways. And we're with the college students right now. We're working with Morehouse School of Medicine, their public health program. And I asked them, I said, hey, I want this to be peer-to-peer -peer education, like college level, um, credible information, but I want you all to educate the AUC center on hookah, specifically hookah, because we know that's trending with college students. They're not using the traditional cigarettes. So you want to get them where they are, but we want your voices to be to be the voice so we can get the message and amplify it. So those are just some of the examples of what we do on a community level, working bottom up, because we don't want no one to come in and feel like we're trying to tell you what to do, but just provide resources to help assist you with some of the issues that we are facing in our community. Jill, so that's uh, amazing examples. I particularly love the localized approach and be able to pivot quickly once you hear from the community about the suggestions, particularly on gift cards saying, hey, this may not be enough. You were able to actually hear that suggestion, receive it and pivot quickly to respond to their needs. And that is so important. Tamara, we're so lucky to have you here today with us. You know, in your work, you're committed to the power of changing the trajectory of our communities. Can you share a little bit more about how this ties with your experience as a tobacco control advocate? Most definitely. Thank you so much for having me. We know that generational health is the new um, generational wealth. In America, we recognize that building economies and jobs is the agenda of many politicians and entrepreneurs. However, we, when you look at healthcare spending, it's in the trillions, and we have an agenda that should be health and economic empowerment, especially in our communities. Um, we know that food and tobacco are the two top health issues that are producing and ending the lives of people around the world. And during my time of working at U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in the Secretary's office, we have the largest procurement budget outside of the Department of Defense. Let that sink in, outside the Department of Defense. And so, for instance, in 2021, the U.S. national health expenditure um, as a share of just our gross domestic product reached 18.3%, the second highest um, in the provided time frame. It was the second, um, the U.S. had the highest health spending based on our GDP compared to other developed countries. Um, and so both public and private healthcare spending in the US is much higher than other developed countries. Um, and so that's why here at WANDA, we know that black women have historically and currently, as we see on the panels today, as we honor International Women's Day and Women's History Month, um, 
we have been the movement makers, we have been the cultural keepers, and we have been the meal healers in our communities. And so centering their voices is critical to building this movement and taking back our communities. And so that's why I'm so proud that Wanda and WCP were, I also sit on our DC branch along with Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids, agreed that flavor should remain only in our meals and not in our tobacco. And so as a resident of Anacostia, which is our Bronx of DC, I'm proud to have played a critical vital role in passing key legislation legislation to not get our kids hooked on vaping and tobacco here in the district and playing flavor bands and e-cigarettes. We know that big tobacco has hooked my own granny, my mama, my auntie, but they will not hook me and my family. And so I just want to thank our Mayor Bowser, the D.C. City Council, um, protecting our children. And when we take to the streets, to the sweets and tweets, we will turn our communities around. Well, Tambra, as a district resident and someone who's from the District of Columbia, I thank you for all your work that you're doing, particularly to help um, some of our kids in the district. Uh, Jaleesa, I'm going to go over to you. I mean, you're quite busy. You lead two coalitions towards health equity, one on health education awareness and research on tobacco, also acronym HEART Coalition, and then the No Menthol Movement, all based in Atlanta. What have you learned from creating opportunities for community members to engage in tobacco control work? I would say the first thing is um, the respect that you have to have within the coalition. So upfront, really having those house rules on when you're making or posing questions to be able to have an open mind because our coalition have it's very diverse. So it comes with people that works in different areas in the field, but also we have our young adults, youth. We also are very mindful of what or, or what they have to say as well, along with our college students and those that simply live in the community. So for me, it's always the respect piece to be able to listen and translate the information that people are, are suggesting so we can be able to mobilize the efforts. Um, if no one's listening and respecting each other, it's not, there's no purpose, right? But within our meeting or structure in our meeting, we always have a detailed agenda um, and also taking the information from those that may, ha may have more proficiency in the area um, to be able to uh, move forward with our work plan. So definitely I would say everyone needs to feel like they're doing something Thin and or creating a platform for others to be able to speak up and also meeting the needs of the communities of where they are. I'll give an example. Whenever our coalition member, he called me, he was like, hey, they're having an event at the Senior Center next Tuesday. Um, I'll be talking about tobacco, but I want you all to speak a little bit more on menthol. Of course, you may know some of our seniors not saying that they're not able to, but they're not really the tech savvy. They don't really want to be on Zoom or Teams or this platform that we're using something new for me as well, too. So we're like, okay, yeah, definitely have some of our home team members. Uh, we'll create package so we can educate the seniors on menthol, tobacco, e-cigarettes, vape, hookahs, because some of these grandparents, they have their nephews living in the household or their grandkids living in the household. And we always know how we can hide, how these kids are getting so smart with hiding vape products, what to look out for. So that is just another example of meeting our communities of where they are to be able to resonate and amplify the message. And also, so being able to raise awareness through whether it's your neighboring planning units, um, speaking to the city council members, going to the town hall meetings, and not only just going because you want something, but going with, with, an, uh, with an servant mindset that, hey, I will be able to offer you this. So it's uh, building a community relationship. Um, the work that I've been doing, I've been here for about six years, but uh, the organization has been here for about 25 years. So having that voice but also creating a safe space for people um, has been some of the greatest takeaway in building the relationship, but also getting things done. We like to say we're a coalition that likes to get the work done, but how you do it first, you know, you got to have the respect factor and you got to make sure you meet in the needs of the community and not telling them what they need, but suggestion, making suggestion and helping them to be able to mobilize so we can get some of the things and creating policies that will make great impact.
Jill, sir, I love that. And I love that you're reaching also uh, the aging population and mm -hmm. because we have to reach in different ways than we reach our youth. So that is so increasingly important. Tamara, I'm going to give you the final word, if you don't mind. You know, the intersection of food insecurity and tobacco use is a really interesting kind of conversation. This work is not without its challenges, however. How do you stay motivated and rejuvenated in order to sustain your commitment to address these two important health inequalities for our community? Well, one, I would say that first I have my own self-care plan. I've doubled down in the midst of the pandemic, um, which that includes becoming a plant mom, having deep meaningful uh, sisterhood, having a family therapist, traveling, biking along the Anacostia Park trails that I did not do in the time I lived here, getting rest, I believe, in the NAT ministry. And let's remember that our existence is part of the resistance. That is the key mantra of Wanda. And as long as Black lives matter, that means our Black health matter, our Black food matters, and our Black lungs matter. And when I think of my own family um, that have died from majority of the chronic diseases, not um, acute issues like my grandmother, she had diabetes, she had a pacemaker, she was a chain smoker, she had a sedentary lifestyle, but she was also self-medicating because of past childhood traumas that occurred. And so my grandma's health lies at the intersection of food and tobacco issues that we're talking about. And that curiosity of wanting to know, being that problem solver uh, in my family uh, forced me to really pursue education in nutrition, in public health, and now a PhD in media technology and democracy at American, examining the food, health, media, uh, intersectionality in this landscape that our communities are having to navigate. That has what fueled me, my passion to this pursuit to create a path to a promised land that did not end where Herod uh, led our ancestors, but that's where it began. And so I have grown up in a military town in Midwest City, Oklahoma, home of Tink Air Force Base, becoming a David L. Bourne National Security Education Scholar and congressional nominee to West Point. But I will tell you this, I quickly understood that the greatest threat for our national security is the threat that's happening right here at home to our health and food systems. And that's why at Wanda we've worked to help the Council on Black Health to create a Black Health Bill of Rights and now leading advocacy efforts for a food bill of rights to be passed nationally and locally and encourage you to sign the petition at iamwanda.org slash food bill of rights because we know that black women are stressed they're depressed but we are still blessed we have metabolic health issues and an epidemic in our communities we are self-medicating with smoking that only exacerbates our issues and so we must ask what is your self-care plan sis how are we role modeling to our children how are we creating a new legacy of health and wealth and how are we advocating for the issues in our communities because that was the spark that happened in the early 1900s and really before in the late 1800s with the black women club movements and so the work of Wanda, the work of so many other Black women uh, who are part of this panel today is a part of building on that legacy that our ancestors planted that seed, not only here in the States, but back to the Queen Mothers of West Africa. That is in our DNA, and that is what we're evoking and moving forward in, and we encourage you to sign up and learn more about our work at IamWanda.org. If there was a mic drop moment, that would be it. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm going to end with that. You know, you said stressed, depressed, but still blessed. And that's a perfect summation of, of this event. And we are blessed to have all of you ladies here fighting for us, seen and unseen. Your work does not go unnoticed. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to my colleague, Camille, who will give our final remarks. Thank you again to our esteemed panelists. Um, and it's been a pleasure to celebrate this International Women's Day with all of you. Camille. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Hawkins. Wow, what a great conversation. Thank you to each of these amazing women, our sisters in this fight, who shared how their advocacy is leading the way for future generations. A few things that have resonated, resonated with me throughout this conversation, you know, are we need to protect our communities and listen to our communities. That's our responsibility, providing the resources and working from the bottom up. Meet people where they are. Here at the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, we're anti-smoking, not anti-smoker. Educating and empowering our community is at our forefront. Hold Big Tobacco accountable. We continue to urge the FDA to finalize and implement the proposed rules that were issued in April of 2022 to prohibit menthol cigarettes and flavored cigars. This bold action will protect kids, advance health equity, and save lives. Thank you again to each of you for your raw and authentic stories. I truly think everyone here can agree 
When Black women lead, we all win. To our audience, we hope this conversation brought forth further interest on taking action on these issues. To get involved and take action, please check out our link tree listed below. And once you're there, under the information tab, click on our advocacy action map to see how you can take action in your state. On behalf of the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, thank you for joining us for Creating Change from the Ground Up, How Black Women Are Leading the Way to Health Equity. Stay tuned for our next cultural conversation.